bridge that goes across like that, right? And kids jump off the bridge into the water. <laughs> it's like a hundred and something feet. <laughs> Okay, enough of the show. Shalom, shalom. Welcome, folks. If we could take our seats, we'll get started here tonight. Once again, welcome to Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue. I'm Rabbi Scott, and it's my privilege to introduce this summer lecture series with Skip Moen uh, and uh, with all of his accolades and accreditations and everything that he brings along with us. Most of us are fans. That's why we're here. Uh, so we will uh, we'll, uh, spend another evening with him just encourage you. Um, as uh, if you're joining us online and you would like to support this ministry, uh, you can make a donation. Uh, there's instructions under the video uh, as well um, to, to go to a link to make a donation online. And we appreciate that. So without any delay, let's get Thank you. Uh, Roseanne, my wife is not here tonight because she is exhausted. So she said after lunch, I have to go to sleep. <laughs> So, so that means that if you were planning on purchasing one of my books, you'll have to wait until afterwards because I have her iPad where I can scan through things, but I can't do it, obviously, when I'm also talking to you. Um, we also should probably recognize that we're doing this in a very Western kind of environment. That is, in rows where everybody looks at the back of, of someone else's head, right? If we wanted to do this in a real Jewish world, we would put a big circle here so that everyone could see each other's face, which, by the way, is quite important when you're going to talk about trauma, that you actually look into the face of other people, right? So I could be really dictatorial and say, okay, we're all going to stand up and move all the chairs, but keep that in mind. So just remember that when you speak, someone else is only seeing the back of your head, so they only see your non-facial expression when how important it is in community to see faces. And by the way, as long as we're talking about that, you know, one of the tragedies of COVID is not the disease, but the mental oppression that occurs when you can't see a person's face anymore, right? It's, it's a, can I be so, uh, so unpolitically correct as to say that it is a, a, uh, it is a, a diminishing of humanity to remove the ability to see a person's face. Now, of course, we might have to do that for health reasons, but the point is, is that as long as we continue to do that, it made us feel less and less like people and more and more like anonymous floating masks up and down the street, right? So that's a very anti-biblical idea. The idea of the Bible is face to face, right? We go face to face with God, we should be face to face with each other. Why is that important? because the essence of community is my ability to see you. And I don't mean to just physically see you. As you know, most communication that happens between human beings is nonverbal, right? It's the way that we sit, the way that we respond, the kinds of inflections that we have, the way our eyes go, the shape of the mouth, all that kind of stuff is the visual signals that tell me what you're really saying. Right? Otherwise, you might as well just text me, which is another issue about being non-human. Right? To reduce my emotions into 64 character bits is to remove me from humanity. You'll recognize this if you realize that Jewish synagogues, until the 8th century, were always in the round and were never separated male and female. Right? Why did that happen? because of the influence of Islam. In Persia, the Jews who lived in Persia in the 8th century adopted 
the Islamic idea of the separation of men and women. And the result is that that tradition carried on and became a tradition in the Jewish culture when it never was before that. <coughs> if you go to the oldest synagogues in the world, one is in Masada and one is in Magdalena, which is, which is very close to the Galilee, okay? They've unearthed the synagogues and, you know, done the archaeology, and guess what they discovered? There's no separation for men and women. There's one bench around the entire thing where everybody sat, right? Pretty clear indication that community was not, uh, was not uh, um, separated by sex. That only occurred after the influence of, an, of another culture began to reshape the thinking of the Jewish world, okay? It isn't the first time, by the way, we're going to talk a lot about how Hellenism reshaped the Jewish world as well, but you should re recognize that you're now a product of that. The very fact that you sit in rows is the influence of the pagan idea of the priest and the participants, right, in the temple services of the pagan empire. The, all of the attention was at the front of the priests who interacted with God, and you, the parishioners, were just spectators. Which, by the way, is also a very ancient Greek idea, that human beings are spectators of the world, not participants in it. In fact, the Greek word physis, which means nature, is essentially everything except human beings, <laughs> right? Because we are the, the omniscient observers of the world, not the participants in the world. And of course, in Hebrew, that's not possible, because we are actually purposed to become agents in the world. That was, our, that, that was God's intention, right? You're not removed from the world. You're an integral part of it. In fact, so much so that you're a maker of the world, right? God begins the creation. Does he finish it? No. Because he expects you to help him finish the project of making the creation, right? Remember we talked about becoming human? Well, you're now becoming like God, which means that you are part of the creative process that he has in mind to bring you to the point where you're acting like him and creating the world, right? There's a really great statement by um, Avia Zornberg when she says that the, the use of language, a human being's use of language is in fact the creator of worlds because as you use language, you change the way that you think and you change the way the world interacts with you, right? Your language alters the way that you think about the world, okay? Um, if you're really interested in how, uh, in how important that is, you can start becoming a philosopher by reading Benjamin Lee Whorf language, thought, and reality. A really fundamental book in how language shapes the way that we think of the world. So our native tongue becomes the way that we understand the world and it takes a lot of effort to think otherwise. Um, how many of you speak more than one language? You, obviously. What do you speak? Basaya? Tagalog? Uh, Tagalog. Tagalog, okay. Tagalog. Right, and you know that in ta Tagalog there are some concepts that can't be translated into English. It just doesn't happen, right? No matter what you do, you can't find the right word in English to communicate that idea in Tagalog, okay? So for me to actually understand your worldview, I must become a native speaker of Tagalog, and that's not gonna happen because I grew up in a mother tongue completely different, right? People who grow up in multicultural um, environments have the ability more likely have the ability to shift from paradigm to paradigm because they recognize that some words only have meaning in one language. And it reminds me of um, when I was at Labrie years and years and years ago, um, John Sandry, who was the um, son-in-law of uh, Francis Schaeffer, was married to one of Schaeffer's daughters and they had three little children, okay? So they lived in Switzerland, of course, and in Switzerland you speak French and German and a language that's only, um, avail that's only spoken in a certain part of Switzerland, and of course they also spoke English. So when I went to their house for dinner, the little girls would start speaking in French or in 
or in the German, and then they would switch back and forth as they were talking to each other because they needed a word that was only, only made sense in German, but they were speaking in French. So they would have a, half of a French sentence and then they'd switch over to German and then they'd go back to English. And I remember their mother saying, speak in one language or the other, <laughs> stop doing it. You know, but they were six, seven years old. So that for them, it was back and forth, no problem, okay? But what it meant was that they had different concepts of the world as they shifted from language to language, okay? So, of course, the biblical language is the same. If you're not a native Hebrew speaker, like we're not native Hebrew speakers, it takes an enormous amount of effort on our behalf to really understand the full nuances of these Hebrew words because they don't come from the dictionary. They come from the tradition, the history, the the family connections that go back generations and generations and generations, and all of that is pulled along with the use of the word, just like in English, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, when we first moved to Italy, we decided to have a Thanksgiving dinner. And of course, no one in Italy had any idea what we were talking about. They don't have Thanksgiving dinner, right? They all said, oh, well, can we come? <laughs> so guess what we had to do? We had to have Roseanne's son fly from the United States with a suitcase full of food that we couldn't get in Italy that would be traditional Thanksgiving meal, like pumpkin for pumpkin pie, right? Because you don't have that in Italy. Like all the different, finally we found somebody who could get us a turkey. But let me tell you, it wasn't a butterball turkey. It came with the feathers and everything else, right? Because Thanksgiving dinner doesn't mean anything in that culture. They were thrilled to come because it was their first experience of Thanksgiving. But it's a completely American idea, right? So imagine what the idea of the Day of Atonement Imagine what the idea of Rosh Hashanah is in a native Hebrew-speaking culture. You might participate in it, but there's all that other tradition that goes along with it that, that in, entails what my father did, what my grandfather did, what my great-grandfather did, what my line that goes back to Poland or to Russia or some, all of that, right? It's all part of that, okay? Well, the same thing is true of trauma. Traumatic events differ according to culture, and the way that we handle them with our language is influenced by the way that we think about them, okay? So I want to introduce to you the idea of reading the Bible, not as a theological text, but as an emotional traumatic text, a, a narrative about trauma, okay? Why do I want to do that? Well, you'll recognize that we started with Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, okay, the world is a mess. You don't belong in it. You're in exile, but at least do these things. By the way, God does not instruct them in any theology at all. He basically says, what I want you to do is to behave like this. He doesn't give them any promises. He doesn't tell them about how wonderful it's going to be when they're blessed, etc. He just says, this is what I want you to do. All right? after we got through the, this is what I want you to do, we realized that that couldn't happen unless we had a change in who we were, thinking about who we were, right? So we had to undo, <coughs> excuse me, we had to undo our Greek paradigm about what a man is or what a woman is and rethink it in terms of purposeful intention in relation to God's plan rather than uh, arms, legs, cognitive, emotional, etc., right? In other words, we're not buying Paul's, and that's because Paul didn't buy it either. It just happened to be translated that way. We're not buying Paul's body, mind, and soul. Sorry, Hebrew doesn't have a tripartite view of man as though somehow the body is separate from the soul, the mind is separate from the body, and you can you know, go to the psychologist for one set of diseases and go to the doctor for another and go to the priest for another. It doesn't work that way. In Hebrew, nefesh, neshma, is one entity, completely homogenized. What happens to one happens to all, right? Uh, ailments to the body affect all the rest of you. 
ailments to the quote-unquote soul affect all the rest of you. It, the Hebrew doesn't see the human being as divided into pieces. Okay, so you're going to say to me, well, wait a minute. Paul talks about body, mind, and soul. In fact, it's a favorite term in Christian theology. How many souls have you saved? As though, you know, in the Catholic tradition, it was perfectly acceptable to use the Inquisition to torture the body in order to make sure that the soul was saved, right? You could punish the body, actually kill the body, as long as the person finally confessed Jesus so that they would go to heaven. Then you saved the soul, okay? Well, Hebrew doesn't think like that at all. In fact, the word in Hebrew for salvation doesn't even mean anything about the soul. It means to rescue someone from imminent danger. Right? That's physical imminent danger. If, if I said to a Jewish man in Jerusalem, are you saved? He would look around and see if there was someone with a gun pointed at him, right? He has no concept that, oh, you mean am I going to heaven? That's a Christian idea. It came from a tripartite view of man which was invested with Greek theology, or sorry, Greek philosophy. It comes from Aristotle and Plato. It doesn't come from Moses for sure, okay? So if I'm thinking in terms of the Western world, then the way that I handle trauma will be very different than the way that the Bible handles trauma because in the Western world, if I have a real traumatic experience and I need to, to deal with it, I go to the therapist, right? I don't, the last thing I do is go down to the 7-Eleven and get myself a nice big Coca-Cola in order to deal with my trauma because sugar will help, right? No, I go to the therapist. Just like I would never think about going to the priest if I have a case of measles. I go to the doctor. But in the Western world, but that Western idea isn't what we find in the Bible. In the Bible, there's a whole different narrative about trauma, and it starts with how we think about these experiences themselves. All right? <coughs> so, let's see what we can find out. The Greek view, then, is like a line in the sand, okay? The Greek view depends on a separation between, um, between differences. In other words, the Greek view is a hard and fast line that says on this side it's one thing, on this side it's another thing, right? It's like the difference between right and wrong. We talked about this yesterday. If I'm right, and I happen to believe that I am, and you don't believe what I tell you, then obviously you're wrong, because I'm right. You can't both be right. It's, I'm sorry, it's not Fiddler on the Roof. Remember that, that great scene where uh, Tevia says, he's having the conversation, and one guy says, well, this is the case, and Tevia says, you're right. And the other guy says, no, 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 this is the case. And Tevia says, no, you're right. And then the third guy says, how can they both be right? And he says, you're right. <laughs> so, I mean, the whole idea there is to break the, the, for, the mold that says that there's a difference between right and wrong that one is right and the other is wrong, okay? That's a Greek view. The Hebrew view, it doesn't work like that. The Hebrew view works like a spiral staircase, okay? It means that there are rights and wrongs, but they don't show up in, um, in, in linear opposition. They show up like, like the, the way that we think of the difference between, no, I'm sorry, they, they show up in the way that Greek and Hebrew differs in its thinking about time. So, let me explain. In the Greek view, time is like a river. And you'll find this in the philosophers, right? In fact, they talk about standing on the river bank and watching the events of the world flow by you. You probably have heard this since you were a kid in school. You're the outside observer on the bank, and what's right in front of you is the present, and what's downstream, the things that have already gone by, are the past, and the things that are upstream that you haven't seen yet are the future. They're there, they're just floating into your view, you haven't seen them yet, right? Our whole, our whole fascination with time travel is built on that idea, that you can just move the position on the bank and, and become, you know, move forward into the future or move backward into the past, okay, because you're outside of that, that stream and you can move back and forth because it is a single stream with events floating by you, okay? 
That all came about because of the Greek idea of change, which is a really long, long t uh, subject that I, I will just hint to you that I've written uh, my PhD on this. And it's a book called God, Time, and the Limits of Omniscience. And you can order it on my website if you want to really, um, what, what should I say? If you want to really uh, drive yourself crazy trying to understand the arguments that are involved, it's 360-some uh, pages of trying to understand this one little idea, what happens when we change our view of time. Okay? But it has huge theological impact because it, what it suggests theologically is that all of the events in my life are already fixed in the river. They just haven't shown up yet. Do you understand? So if all of the events are in the stream and all I'm doing is observing them as they come by, then all of the events that affect me in my life are already in the stream and I'm simply waiting for them to come into the present. Which means, of course, I don't have any choices that will actually affect anything in the future because the events already exist, right? We get this idea, unfortunately, from, theology, from philosophy, and it makes its way into theology with the idea that God knows everything, including the past, present, and future events of my life, okay? Now you want to say, but that's what omniscience means, to know everything. Yes, of course, omniscience does mean to know everything that can be known. But there are some things that can't be known. And obviously God can't know something that can't be known because it's not knowable. What are those things? Well, if I have any free choice at all, the event that actually describes what I'm going to do can't be known until it happens, right? Because until then, it isn't an event. It's just a possibility. So it's, it's certainly conceivable that God would know all the possibilities, but because they're not actualities, they don't actually exist until I make the choice, which means that I have the freedom to make choices that alter the direction of the river. Now, think about the impact of that. What it says is that what I choose today alters the course of eternity. Do you understand? If, if it actually changes what God knows because it becomes not a possibility but an actuality, then it changes the course of the cosmos. It changes the course of the universe, right? It, think of, of, of time like a branching tree. So here's the trunk, and now it holds all the branches. Which branch will I take? Well, whatever branch I take will change the direction that I'm climbing the tree. Right? And every time I, came, I come to a fork in the branch, whichever one I take will change the rest of the outcome, won't it? Okay? And you're thinking to yourself, wow, that's really great because now I have a legitimate justification for free will. In other words, I really do make choices that make a difference. Does it sound good? Would you rather have that or would you rather have the stream of events in the river ahead of you that you can't do anything about that are just going to flow into your life and you just play out the role as though it meant something but it was already chosen in advance, right? Which one would you like? Free will that actually changes the universe or events that are already in place that you just play the role in? Shall we have a vote? Which one do you prefer? Careful, because there are consequences. <laughs> okay, what do you think? Which one? You want free choice, right? Does that make you feel good? I mean, now you actually decide and it makes a difference? Great, I'm so glad you said that because now the consequences of the universe lie on your shoulders, okay? So when you got up today, let's see, you decided to wear the Virginia Beach shirt today, right? What other shirts were in your closet? Was there a different color one? Was there a pink colored one? Yeah. Okay, so you know that if you chose the pink colored one, you would have prevented the next war between Russia and Iran. <laughs> because everything is connected, right? Everything is connected. Okay? You can't make a choice without it affecting the rest of the universe, right? 
So the fact that you chose the Virginia Beach one means that 200,000 people will die in the next missile <laughs> that hits in the Ukraine, right? Do you understand that? Okay. I chose to wear sandals instead of shoes. That means that there'll be an economic disaster in Egypt that will, that will cause 15,000 children to starve. If I had put on shoes, it would change the course of the universe, right? Do you see what's going to happen? It's lovely to have free choice when you think it only matters for the big choices. But every choice matters. And since every choice matters, every choice you make alters the course of the universe. Okay? So now how do you feel about your free choice? Right? I mean, listen, there's only one person that can handle that kind of responsibility. God. Right? All the rest of us are in a guess and hope. Right? Well, okay, today I decided to wear my Ferrari shirt. I don't know, God, that maybe that's the wrong thing to do because who knows now, you know, something really disastrous is going to happen because I chose to wear the Ferrari shirt instead of the Lamborghini one. I'm really sorry, God, but there's nothing I could do about it for the consequences because I really wanted to, to, to wear the Ferrari shirt. And had you told me if I wore the Ferrari shirt this would have happened, then I would have changed my mind. But of course, if I changed my mind, that also would have meant something else had happened. Right? Do you understand? There's no way with free will you get out of responsibility. You now become responsible for everything. Okay? Whatever choice you make now will affect everything. That means the choices that you made in the past affect your children and your children's children and the course of the nation and who gets into power and who doesn't get into power and what happens in the economy and on and on and on we can just continue with the list until it's so overwhelming that the only thing you can say is God grant me grace, right? So ultimately free will, even though it's justifiable, forces us to plead for mercy because there's no way we can know all the consequences of what our choices will be, right? We're basically flipping a coin and hoping that it comes out right because we don't know what the long-term consequences are, okay? Now, imagine that if we read the Bible in that kind of, of context, imagine if we read the Bible and the stories in the Bible as though they were people struggling with the consequences of their choices and God's oversight to look in there and give us some hints about what was happening because they don't know. How will Abraham have any possibility of knowing what his choices will be and the consequences for those choices 15 or 20 or 50 or 100 generations later? It's not possible for a human being to know that. All he knows is the trauma that he faces now. And then God pulls the curtain back for us and 2,000 years later says, don't you see how that worked? But of course, Abraham doesn't see that. He can't see it. He's human, just like us. Okay? So now let's go look at some of those stories and see if we can tease out what happens when traumatic events affect the way that we make choices and what the Bible has to say about it. Okay? <clears throat> what does this mean for truth? Well, it does some really funny things for truth. First, it tells us that the Greek system of truth doesn't work. Because the Greek system of truth is about cognitive statements. In other words, I know something is true because what I believe matches the external reality that I see, right? So if I tell you Mount Rainier is 14,408 feet high, you will know if I'm saying the truth if you go and check. You measure the height of Mount Rainier and you find out that it's 14,410 feet. So what I told you isn't true because it doesn't match reality. That's the Greek idea, right? I determine truth on the basis of its, of its um, what's the right word? On the basis of its confirmation in reality, okay? So, let's try this. I love my wife. Ha, okay, where are you gonna go measure that? Ah, Tanya's shaking her head, oh I know. Hand me the checkbook. <laughs> okay? The point is we work in a world where, where true statements are not always confirmable by, by checking the reality, right? By looking at the observable fact. 
We certainly know that marriage means more than having a certificate in the county records office, but we, don't, we can't specify all the things that make up what it means to be married because there are a lot of things in there that aren't actually measurable, right? Okay, so a statement being either right or wrong depends on a Greek idea where I can check it against the observable reality. But if truth, if I believe that truth is only the correspondence between what I believe and what the world shows me, I'm going to leave out a very important part of what the Bible is all about. Because the Bible is not about true statements. The Bible is about emotionally true statements. And there's a big, big difference. Okay? Does that mean that there isn't that there aren't statements of truth in the Bible? Of course there are. The Bible is a mixture. See, it's a mixture of of my connection with the observable world. Like, for example, did the uh, Israelites leaving Egypt actually cross the Sea of Reeds? Okay, I'll go check it. I, you know, go and investigate and see what was there. Were there really, was there really a city in David's time that had two gates? Most cities don't, right? Yes, in fact, there was. We found one, okay? Did the house of David actually exist? One of the greatest archaeological finds in a place called Tel Dan was, the, was a fragment of a stone which actually says the house of David, right? So we have archaeological record. But, that, but do those things really, I mean, they're exciting, but do they really capture what I'm trying to understand as God's word in the, in the text? I don't think so. I think what we, what we really want to know is what happened to those people? <coughs> what happened to their lives as God interacted with them? So I want the story behind the facts, not just the facts. I don't want the theology. I want the emotional uh, involvement. I want to see what happened when God came into their lives or didn't come into their lives. Right? I want to know why it is that in the book of Ruth, God is never mentioned until the very end, and yet it's filled with God-like behavior. I want to know that. Right? I want to know what the stories are about. So that means I want to follow the spiral staircase. I'm not looking for a yes-no. I'm looking for how do I go down the spiral staircase so I get deeper and deeper and deeper into the story so that I can understand what it is that God's trying to communicate. And in case you see the shoe that's standing right there on that first step, that's mine. And this is the staircase in the inside of the tower of Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And it's scary because there's no railing, right? Right. <coughs> so I want to go down there. I want to find out what's at the very bottom of this staircase so I can understand how it all connects all the way up, okay? So, in Hebrew thought, there's no word for abstract time. In fact, Hebrew doesn't think in abstract terms at all. Are you saying, wait a minute, there are words for time? Day, week, month, season, festival, etc.? Of course there are. But there's no idea of time as an abstract thing, like we have a word for time, right? There are only examples of temporal events, a day, a week, a season, a month, okay? In other words, Hebrew is grounded in the reality of experience, not in the reality of cognition. It's not how I think about things, it's how I experience things. So in Hebrew thought, certain kinds of patterns are repeated in experience and those become important for me understanding how one story is linked to another. But it's not circular. Let's go back. You see this? It's a circle, but it's not circular. In other words, it isn't that I walk down those stairs and end up in the same place I started. It's that I end up in the same vertical space but at a different level, right? What do I call this? It's actually called a cycloidal. Remember, um, I don't know when you were a kid, maybe. When I was a kid, we had things called slinkies. Do you remember those? Okay, 
they're wound up and you put them at the top of the stairs and they're so cool because as they unwind, they walk down the stairs, okay? They were cycloidal. In other words, you could start at one end and work your way through the entire slinky and come out the other end, never actually coming back to the same place you started, right? Because it was, a, it was round, it was a circle, but it didn't end. It just kept going around and around, okay? That's what Hebrew time is like. So when you go around the circle, you will end up at a place that if you looked vertically is exactly where you were on another level, but now you're in a different spot, right? Think of it like this. If you paint a white dot on the, on the outside of a bicycle tire and you ride the bicycle down the street, the, si the wheel goes around and around in a circle. But every time the white dot touches the ground, it's in a different place, right? It's a cycloidal idea, okay? Why is that important? Because in the Bible, there are clues that tell you, pay attention to this white spot. You've seen it before in a different story, okay? <clears throat> in other words, the stories are not independent of each other. They're connected to each other. And the connections are almost as important as the story itself because it tells you that this story has something to tell you about that story, okay? Let me give you an example. And he listened to his wife. Okay? Where does that story come from? Where does that verse come from? Abraham, right? And he listened to his wife. Where else does it come from? Did, you, did I hear someone say, Adam? Oh my gosh, does that mean that when Abraham, when in Abraham's story it says, and he listened to his wife, I should remember that there was another story that used the same words and look at that story to see what's happening in Abraham's life. In other words, one trauma is related to another trauma, okay? And by the way, it happens all the time. It doesn't happen in English so often, but it sure as heck happens in Hebrew over and over and over. One word, one phrase used in one place that connects to another place that connects to another place. And if you read it in Hebrew, it jumps off the page because you say to yourself, oh, I heard that before. Where did I hear that? Oh yeah, I went, okay. Our problem in English is that we love synonyms. And so we translate the remaining phrases not identically, but in synonym language, which means that from an English perspective, we don't think it's saying the same thing, okay? I'll, I can help you with this. Robert Alter did a translation of the Hebrew Bible in three volumes. It's probably, I don't know, two, 3,000 pages maybe. Worth reading, just pick it up on the weekend and, you know, okay? But the reason that it's important is because one person did the entire translation. It's not a committee. And one of Alter's um, presuppositions about the translation is that whenever he found a Hebrew word in one place, he did everything possible to translate it by the same English word in all the other places. So for the first time in English, you can see the connections. Right? And he even makes notes at the bottom to tell you this word is connected because I've taken this translation, you will find it here and here and here. So for the first time in English, you actually have a Hebrew Bible that will help you connect these ideas that are clear in Hebrew but get lost in English. Did you have a question? What was the name? I'm sorry? What was the name of it? Uh, the Hebrew Bible. No, I mean the Robert Alter. A L T A R, Alter. Okay? It's. Um, and it comes in a nice slipcase, and it's about this big. <laughs> and it comes in three pieces. The books of Moses, the writings, and the prophets. Okay? Just like the normal Hebrew division. Okay? But the reason it's important is because when you read his translation, you will see connections that you didn't see before. Because if you're reading the NASB, the committee likes synonyms. And so you get different translations for the same Hebrew word, okay? Do you remember when we talked about chesed yesterday, okay? So depending on which English Bible you have, you might have mercy, loving kindness, uh, kindness, um, all kinds of different, you know, translations for a Hebrew word, 
that's so important that you need to know where it shows up every time it shows up. Okay? You don't need a synonym. You need the identical word. And one of the other things about English translations is English translators don't like to use the same word over and over because English style requires variation. Hebrew doesn't on purpose because Hebrew wants you to connect. Okay? So, and he listened to his wife, will show up exactly the same way, and he listened to his wife, right? And you'll start looking for, and he listened to his wife, and you're going to find it in other places as well. And of course, it's not the only case. There are lots of cases like that, but you need a way to be able to discover it. Why? Because I want to know what happened to Abraham and Sarah is a repetition of what was happening with Adam and the woman. They're connected. How are they connected? Ah, that's for me to find out. But they are connected, or the Hebrew Bible wouldn't use the same phrase. It's giving you a clue. It's saying, oh, don't read this story anymore. Stop right here. Go back and read the story of Adam and the woman and see how they're related. Okay? All right. Now, pay attention to what this guy says. And Did you get that? There's a difference between truth and fiction. Fiction has to make sense. Okay? So if you want to read the Bible and you think you're going to make sense of it, then you might as well consider it fiction because the Bible is about truth and it doesn't always make sense. It's our, it's our Western proclivity towards certainty and resolution that forces the Bible to make sense. But it's experience, and experience doesn't always make sense. Okay? So, with that in mind, let's start looking at some of these things that show up that maybe don't make too much sense, but that's because they're about real world experience, right? Truth in the Bible is about reliability not necessarily about the connection with observable reality. Right? Remember in, in Greek thinking, a true statement means that, it has a, that, it ha that I can connect it to the actual observable event. I can go measure the height of Mount Rainier. I can tell you how much rain occurred today because I have my little gauge. Okay? But that's not what truth is about in the Bible. Truth in the Bible is about the reliability of the story. Reliable doesn't mean necessarily that it matches the facts. Reliable means that it's something I can count on. Okay? In other words, it's relational. I can count on the relationship that's involved. But it doesn't necessarily correspond to the external world. Right? It's event scenario. And it follows the statement of the man in the movie. It follows the idea that truth doesn't always have to make sense. In Hebrew, true is a story told from many different perspectives. Right? So I can have more than one view of the same event in the Hebrew Bible they don't have to match because I'm not interested in the facts of the matter. I'm interested in the event from different perspectives. Let me give you an example, a perfect example. When Yeshua meets the demoniac, you know the story? How many people, how many people does he meet? Is it one or two? Well, take your choice. In one gospel account, it's one. In another gospel account, it's two, which is true. Ah, you see, now I've forced the text to become Western. In other words, I've said, well, it can't be one and two. It has to be either two or one. I'm forcing it into a perspective that only allows confirmation by observable reality. Instead of asking, why would the author of one view of the account, choose one demoniac for his story, and the author of another view of the account, choose two. 
What was the motive behind the author? Not what was the reality of the number of people, but why did he make that choice? Okay? And by the way, there are many, many examples of this. Right? Did David slew, uh, sl did David kill 700 or 7,000? Was the attack on A by Joshua at the beginning of the campaign or at the end of the campaign? Did the Genesis account include, you know, take, take an example. Well, how many things do we have to line up before we realize that it's event-oriented? It's, its purpose is to communicate the story, not necessarily the facts. One of the things that, that often bothers me the most is to try to turn the Genesis 1, the first chapter of Genesis, into pre-science so that we're now talking about the Big Bang Theory in relation to Genesis. But the Big Bang Theory has nothing to do with Genesis 1 because Genesis 1 is a counterposition to Egyptian cosmology, which is not about the beginning of the world. It's not about how the world began. It's why the world began. It's a big, big difference, right? It's not a description about all of the mechanics that went into making the world. It's a description of why God created. What was the purpose? Okay? So, what this means is when we deal with our own trauma, we should be able to look into the Bible and find examples of emotionally distressing scenarios and look for the purposes behind the way that the authors constructed that narrative to teach us something. We want to go down the spiral staircase until we find something in there that we can identify and discover something about God's relationship to the people who are in the story and God's relationship to us. In other words, it's, er it's anything but straight line thinking. Because straight line thinking is identify the problem, find the cause, apply the solution, resolve the problem. Right? <clears throat> If Roseanne were here, she would tell you that my approach to most, and I, maybe it's all men, I'm not sure. My approach to most problems is, okay, let's figure out what the problem is. We can figure out the causes. Ah, we can fix that and we'll resolve it, okay? And what's really interesting is, and maybe it's just a woman thing, but Roseanne doesn't deal with problems like that. Roseanne is more interested in how she feels about the problem rather than trying to find a solution. And most of the time, if she comes to me with a problem, she just wants me to listen to how she feels, not fix it. Oh, there's some agreement across the <laughs> see? Okay. I think, I think that's because men are mm, inclined to be more cognitive than relational. Right? We grew up in a world where our job was to fix things. Right? Whereas I believe that if you read my book, Guardian Angel, you'll see that there's a big argument behind this. I believe that women were designed relationally on purpose so that they have a built-in radar for how things feel, which is exactly the correction that I need in order to make sure that I'm not just a thinking machine. Okay? So that means that I tend to be more Greek than my wife because she is interested in the emotive quality of the issue and I'm interested in the cognitive resolution side. Um, and he listened to his wife. <laughs> and he should have listened to his wife, okay? But the problem is that trauma isn't cognitive. Hmm? Trauma is not rational. Okay, this is a really, really important thing that you have to understand. Trauma is not rational. Right? So you're in an accident. And the accident is so intense that it freezes your emotions to the point where you can't function. In fact, I can give you an example. There's a really famous story of a, th of a therapist's encounter with a woman who, when she was in a car accident, it was so horrendous, the accident occurred with a truck. The back of the truck came through the car, the truck caught on fire, they thought they were going to burn to death, she was rescued. Okay? From that point on, she was unable to drive. Okay? Not rational. 
There was nothing wrong with her. She survived the accident. You know, there was no reason why she couldn't get behind the wheel and drive a car, but she was unable to because the trauma so changed her perspective on being in an automobile that she went into panic to even think about getting into the automobile, okay? Well, will cognitive therapy help? No, because cognitive therapy is rational. Here's the problem, let's identify the cause, here's the solution. We'll just, you can just practice driving a little bit at a time. Sorry, doesn't work that way, okay? Emotional management does not occur in a linear fashion. Emotional management is the spiral staircase. It's not the straight line. I can't get an answer to my problem by just working my way cognitively down the line. Something happens in trauma that disrupts the rational processing in my mind, okay? So, trauma is repetitive disruption feeling frozen in the past, triggered by some present experience that is not integrated into my story, okay? So think of it like this. I'm going along in my life perfectly happy and a traumatic event occurs. The traumatic event stops my life at that point. My life picks up after the event occurs and goes on. But every time I'm reminded of that traumatic event, I go right back to that place and I live it out as though it were present reality, okay? <laughs> if something traumatic happens to you as a child, if something traumatic happens to you in an accident, if something traumatic happens to you because of a life death situation in your adult life, you freeze in that moment and until that moment is integrated into the rest of the story so that it becomes part of a narrative instead of a instead of a stop-start part, you will not be able to resolve what's happening in that trauma. And every time it occurs, it'll take you right back there, okay? Now, what we ought to ask ourselves is, oh my gosh, are there cases in the Bible that are just like that? People who are stuck in trauma and not able to move forward because the emotional damage that occurs in that traumatic event is not resolved and every time there's a trigger, it pulls them right back into it, okay? And I think that there are plenty of examples about that, and I think that the reason we need to investigate those is so, so that we can see how God deals with that stuff, because he has to, right? He's not going to be able to have the, the people who experience traumatic events be effective, purposeful human beings in the world that he's trying to, to uh, renovate if they're constantly being frozen by something that happened in their past that doesn't allow them to continue to be human, okay? So let's see what this means. <clears throat> the first implications is that if we start dealing with trauma as straight line applications, right? Identify the problem, fix the causes, change the circumstances, come up with a solution. What that means is that we're constantly struggling with what we call backsliding. Right? In other words, you make progress, then all of a sudden something happens that reminds you of the trauma, and now you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm right back where I started. I can't get rid of that sinful behavior. Every time it happens, I fall right back into the rut that I was in before. I can't make any progress. What's the matter with me, God? How come I ask for forgiveness over and over, but every time this happens, I fall right back into it? Ah, huh. what does that tell you? You're thinking straight line as though progression just continued on this gradual uphill thing, and every time the trauma happens, you feel like you fell back down the hill and you're in the myth of Sisyphus, pushing the rock up and then falling backwards, right? The problem with uncomfortable experiences is that they are hard to, rem it's hard to remember that they are temporary. This is made worse by our notion of diagonal line of growth. We're eternally climbing up the steep hill and feeling that any backslide terrifies us. After all, gravity having its way would have us careening back down the diagonal line as if we were in a game of chutes and ladders, okay? Now, this isn't just Greek, it's Egyptian. What was the underlying cosmology of Egypt? The chaos underneath it all that's trying to make its way up into your life and destroy you, okay? 
So when trauma happens and we are unable to resolve it, it's like feeling these uncontrollable somethings that are after us, that are going to drag us back down, right? And if and since you can't control it, since it freezes you in that moment, and the trigger event causes all those panic emotional feelings to occur again, all the lack of safety, all the threat, everything else, all happens over again. You feel like you've made no progress at all, and you're right back in the chaos, okay? But what if growth is cycloidal? What if we, th we looked at it as a staircase, not as a straight line? On the straight line, you're either going up or down. In a cycloidal staircase, you're always going up and down. <laughs> it's part of what the staircase is. You can be going up and down at the same time, right? It just depends on which direction you're going in the staircase. It's okay to go up and down in the staircase. That's the idea. The cycle takes you around and around so that each time you go around, you come to the same point vertically where you were before, but in a different location. Right? Is every time you go around a defeat? No. It's part of the journey to go around one more time, come back to the same place vertically, but be in a different spot. Right? Trauma exists because emotional life is a spiral. That's just the way it is. <coughs> right? <coughs> life isn't a straight line. Life is a spiral. So of course you're going to come back to those things. That's what it means to be alive. The question is, each time you come back, are you going to recognize that you're actually at a different level in the staircase? Right? I believe that one of the reasons that Hebrew gives you hints about reading the story of Adam and the woman when you encounter the same event in Abraham and Sarah is to see that you're in the same event at a different level. That now it's possible to choose otherwise because you're no longer in the Garden of Eden. Now you're in the wilderness desert with Adam or with Abraham and Sarah and other choices can be made, even if the same emotional trauma event is occurring. Okay, so let's see what we find out. All the information stored in our brains and bodies is memory. Our history is memory, our identities are memory, our abilities are memory. The way we are in relationships is memory. And the trauma we experience impacts memory at every point. The way you take in information, the way you store information, the way you retrieve information. Without understanding memory, you really can't fully understand or have compassion for your response to the trauma. Or to the way you're protected and continue to protect yourself from trauma and why it is so hard to heal from it. Why? Because it's not the real observable world it's the real memory world. And the memory is what constitutes you, right? There's a great um, psychotherapist, Paul Tournier, who used to say that we are only able to communicate who we are when we are able to tell someone else of our memories, right? We communicate who we are because of what we remember about ourselves. The things that you've forgotten are no longer part of you in the conscious world, but they certainly can be part of you in the unconscious world and continue to affect you until they're brought into the light and become a part of your recognizable spiral staircase, right? We can go back to the picture. All those dark shadows as you look down that spiral staircase, they're all real. They're all there. The question is, are you willing to bring them out step down into that dark place so that they become the reality that you're dealing with now as you go around and around deeper and deeper down the spiral staircase, okay? So this helps me figure out that what I really am dealing with in the Bible is not event history, but memory history. God is providing me with, st how, this is so clever. God is just, you know, he's pretty smart. <laughs> and he says, I'm not going to give you a therapy manual. I'm going to give you the stories of people who went through this. 
And as you read those stories, they will help you see what happened to these people so that you can identify how you would have responded in those circumstances. That's taking one more flight of stairs down. Right? Now you're in the same vertical position, but you're in a different place. So now let's see how you would have dealt with it. Okay? So Abraham Heschel says, to believe is to remember. Now what he's talking about is becoming part of the memory of Israel. My, my dear friend Moshe Kempinski in Israel has this really great saying. Every Jew is 3,000 years old. Right? Why? Because memory is what makes you Jewish. It's not conversion. It's becoming part of a history, becoming an integral part of a history that goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's embracing that story as my story. The story is God's narrative of reliability that needs to be reconstructed in my life, right? So reconstructing the story as our story is the overall purpose of the Bible. The purpose of the, of the biblical narrative is to draw me into a story that belongs to me. Right? I mean, think about it. How, when, we, when Rosanna and I moved to Italy, one of the reasons that we did it is because she has history. Right? Both, of her, both, both sets of grandparents came from Sicily. So Rosanna's in the process of, Italian, of applying for Italian citizenship because under Italian law she can become an Italian citizen because of her grandparents' history. Okay? So think of it this way. God wants you to belong to his history. In order to do that, you need to become a citizen. How do you become a citizen? You show that your history is aligned with who you are now so that you have the right to apply for a history of belonging to a people that God chose 5,000 years ago. Right? You want to make your history that history. Just like Rosanne is saying, you see, my grandparents came from Sicily when they came to America. They were still Sicilian. And so now I can claim citizenship on the basis of my history. So you can claim citizenship in God's community on the basis of the history that he's going to provide. And that history is what makes you identical with the people in the narratives that he gave you so that you can connect with them, right? The Bible is... God's continual history of his interaction with the people that he brought out of Egypt, which is why he says over and over and over, clear into the prophets, 2,000 years after the event, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Why? Why does he have to remind them? Don't they know that? Of course they know, but they need to be reminded because their history depends on what God did thousands of years before when he chose them as a people, right? Right? So that helps me recognize that no matter where I am on that spiral staircase, no matter how deep my trauma is in my life, something else is, always, is already happening. And that is, God has his hands on me in the spiral staircase to bring me into alignment with the people that he's been dealing with for three or 4,000 years, all of whom experienced traumatic events. Okay. All right, let's see what he does. Why does Hebrew provide clues like word links and patterns from one story to another? To connect you to the history. Right? Why are the same Hebrew themes found in multiple biblical accounts? Because you're on the staircase going around and around and around. And every time you go around, you come back to the same kind of theme running vertically up and down in the history. What is the Bible's view of truth and fiction? Well, what's true? What you experience in the process, not what I can claim to justify because of the facts, but what happens in my life as a result of that, right? I often tell people that they get, people get really upset because they think, um, oh my gosh, if I don't have the right theology, I, you know, my whole religion will fall apart. What? You don't believe that 
Yeshua is the divine son of God, the second person in the Trinity. Oh my gosh, if you don't believe that, you're going to go to hell. John MacArthur. Right? No, what I say is, okay, good. I'm glad you have the theology. But what really matters is the experience. And no matter what the experience is, no one else can ever take that away from you. Because your experience is your unique involvement with the God of Abraham, and it's yours. No matter what the theology is, the theology is just the interpretation of the experience. The interpretation can be all over the place, right? Some of the interpretation can make sense and some of it not make sense. And if you want to have the theological argument, I can take you through most of those things. But the point is, I cannot challenge your experience because it's yours. It belongs to you. It's private between you and God. And how you choose to share that experience with your community makes your private experience part of the community's experience. Right? Forget the theology. Actually, I don't think God cares too much about theology. Right? If theology is basically a human invention. Um, you know, theo you know what the word theology means, right? The study of theos. But I don't think God's too interested in us studying him. I think he's far more interested in us relating to him, which means that your experience is what I'm looking for in these stories. God's intention in the Bible is to demonstrate to you the experience of other people in relation to him. And as you connect to that, your own experience will, will grow, will be strengthened, okay? So let's look and see what happens. How can I tell you how I feel if I don't know how I feel myself? So the first thing I have to do is identify how do I really feel. And by the way, most Westerners have no idea how they actually feel. Right? I'm going to give you a little help, a little, a little um, aid in that in a minute. But understand that one of the Look, I, I've been going to a therapist for a long time, and one of the things we worked on for a long, long time was, but how do you really feel? <laughs> because I have all kinds of ways to express the things that I think I feel, only to discover that there's something else happening underneath it that I wasn't aware of, okay? Knowing what I feel, or knowing what we feel, is the first step to knowing why we feel that way. If you're interested in Van der Kolk's work, it's uh, the body knows the score, or the body keeps the score. And what he says is, most of the time, the feelings that we really have to deal, deal with are so disguised, so hidden by our own cultural, um, what's the right word? Uh, the, the idea that we can only say certain kinds of things. You know, cultural, um, uh, I can't think now. Norms. Norms, yes. We're so trapped by our cultural norms that we're not allowed to say things like, you know, I was just really blank, blank, hating my mother for what she did. We're not allowed to say that. So I can't deal with the anger there because it's so repressed that I won't allow myself to feel that. After all, it wasn't a good thing to feel, right? It took a long time for me to get through that. And by the way, in getting through it, I discovered why I felt that way and why she was she acted that way, and it was because of the trauma in her life. And now I realize she was damaged, and damaged goods damaged other people. She couldn't help it, right? Physical self-awareness is the first step to releasing the tyranny of the past. So I must first identify how I really feel physically in order to get at the emotions that are behind it, okay? So there you go. There's your aid. You can get this online, by the way. It's called the feelings wheel. And it might really be helpful because look at the core. The center is mad, scared, joyful. Uh, I have to read it upside down. Uh, something. Peaceful and sad. Uh, joyful. I can't read that. Powerful. Yes. Powerful, peaceful, and sad. Those are the, the six. Okay? But we don't talk like that. What do we talk about? Oh, I feel inadequate. Oh, my gosh. I'm jealous. Oh, I feel isolated and apathetic. We're so far removed from the core feelings that it takes a whole bunch of work to just get through the outer layers so that we can start identifying what's really happening in the center. Okay? Now, what's wonderful about the biblical stories is that they drive us right to the center. They don't fool around with, oh my gosh, I feel sleepy. No, sorry. They go right to sad. Okay? 
Oh my gosh, I don't feel secure, or I feel secure. Nope, let's go talk about shalom, shalom in Isaiah, right? In other words, the Bible helps me get to the middle of this stuff in a hurry. Because if I'm going to read those stories as emotional, then I'm going to have to deal with the emotions that the characters feel, okay? If you go online, this is called the feelings wheel. And by the way, it, it's a construction of a... Um, of an academic at the University of Florida in uh, Pensacola, I think. Anyway, it's very helpful. All right, so we're going to take these ideas and apply them to the biblical text and see what we can come up with. The Bible has trauma treatment. Human beings are hardwired for connection. And we are hardwired from infancy, infancy to find safety in relationships. Trauma breaks this connection. Trauma interferes with the feelings of safety associated with connection. So, ultimately, the traumatic events that occurred in my life made me feel unsafe. That's the really the bottom line of this thing. I just don't feel safe. And when I don't feel safe, other things happen. Right? I do things to protect myself. I do things to avoid the trauma. I make choices to push it away or keep it isolated or not deal with it. And those things do other things. And pretty soon my life becomes a process of making sure that I don't deal with the connections that were so terrifying to me. Okay? So we can start looking for this in the biblical accounts, by the way. Um, let me give you an example. Bathsheba. Do you think that Bathsheba knew that David arranged for her husband to die in battle? Oh, wait a minute. That's the way we normally read the story. Okay? But what if she didn't? What if she thought that God had rescued her and forgiven her of her adultery by removing her husband so that she could legitimately marry the king and wipe away all that scandal, right? What if she never knew that her husband actually arranged for her married, that the king actually arranged for her husband to die, and instead she was praying, Lord, help me get out of this impossible situation. I've been with the king, but I'm married. Help me avoid this scandal. And then all of a sudden she gets the news that her husband has died in battle and he's a hero. Oh my gosh, it removes all of that supposed scandal that she would have to face. Until when? Until Nathan shows up. And then she realizes that David did it all. What kind of impact do you think that has on David and Bathsheba at that point? Now she realizes that the king, her now husband, had her former husband killed. What kind of impact, what kind of trauma do you think happens? Right? Maybe we need to rethink the story so that we start asking ourselves, because otherwise, we're, how do we understand Bathsheba otherwise? That she just dismisses the fact that her husband was killed in battle and everything's fine, I'm just gonna move in with the king? I don't think so. I think something else is happening there that Hebrews asking us to fill in the story, the gaps, so that we can start to explain the kind of behavior that is part of the text, but doesn't make any sense from an emotional perspective, yes? Well, I think that there might actually be something else going on there. And I'm actually writing a book about all this that eventually I'll get done, maybe. Okay? I'm not so sure that Bathsheba isn't the one who's actually arranging the whole thing. Because it seems to me that her behavior, if I read between the lines, uh, points to a woman who decides that she wants more than she's going to get from one of the soldiers, who, by the way, is a Hittite, Right? So she's not going to go anywhere in the, in the Jewish community with the Hittite husband. And so she makes an arrangement to elevate herself because she wants more than just being a, the wife of a Hittite. 
ah, now intrigue starts to show up. So there's all kinds of other emotional stuff going on there, right? The whole point is that until we start to break that apart, we really, we, we read the story and we just gloss over it as though there's no really emotional connection there, no psychic trauma, no devastating effect on Bathsheba. All we look at is David. Oh my gosh, who is this man? Oh, I've sinned, Lord. But wait a minute, David's married. And, they, and a son dies. And all, you know, look, there's lots and lots of stuff going on here that we just pretend isn't part of the story. But it is, right? We're supposed to identify with that. We're supposed to rethink that story. We're supposed to ask ourselves, wait a minute, what's happening here? How come it's so easy for us to just gloss over all this stuff instead of asking ourselves, what's really going on here in the family dynamics? Right. Okay. The very nature of trauma is that it's unspeakable. All right? You won't find Bible verses like this. And the trauma that affected them can be resolved by such and such. No. The Bible recognizes that the way that you understand what's happening to, in the trauma in these people's lives is to read their story from your emotional perspective. Because that's the only way that they can speak. They can't say it. Right? <coughs> oh, sorry. All trauma is pre-verbal. Trauma by nature drives us to the edge of comprehension, cutting us off from language based on common experience or imaginable past. Why? Because it's what you feel, not what you can say. Once I can bring it into the world of language, I can deal with it. But trauma doesn't work that way. Trauma is this uncontrollable, threatening feeling that happens to me that I really can't put my finger on. But something's happening to me. I just don't know what it is. I can't deal with that. Right? Don't say those things. You know, it's because I can't get myself into the language that I need in order to deal with it. Right? How does Adam treat Hava after the fall? Okay, so we go through the story, Genesis chapter 3, right? <coughs> she says, un naively says to her husband, hey, let, you should try this. Try it, you'll like it, right? <laughs> you should try this, and he does, okay? And then there's this really interesting verse, and it says that God is looking for them in the garden, and um, the Hebrew is really interesting. We have this, the, ver the sentence, and uh, he heard the voice, and he heard the voice of God walking in the garden, right? Or he heard something like that in English, but that's not what it says in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it says, and he heard the voice of God coming from all directions at the same time. Okay? It's not like he heard God walking in the garden, because obviously you can't hear an incorporeal being anyway, but he heard God's voice coming from every direction at once, which is why he realizes he can't escape. Okay? Then God says to him, how come you're not with me? Where are you? Two verbs in Hebrew for where. One of them is, is geographical location. The other is surprise. How come you're not here? Where are you? And what does Adam say? There's a very interesting construction, verbal construction in Hebrew. Uh, <coughs> I have to give you a little grammar. Okay, in Hebrew, if I put a vav, that's the letter that looks like a little hook, okay, you know? If I put a vav in front of a verb, it changes the, the tense of the verb, okay? So if I put a vav in front of a future verb, it becomes past. Right? So in this particular sentence, Adam says, I, God says, you know, where are you? And he says, I was afraid, and so I hid myself. Okay? But it's a vav consecutive, which means that the actual verb is, I was afraid, I am afraid, I will be afraid. So he's not identifying a, a statement of fact. He's identifying a statement of identity. He's saying, I am the fearful one. 
I have been afraid, I am afraid, I will continue to be afraid. All in the same verb. Okay? He's re-establishing his identity in front of God as one who's afraid. Okay? Why is that important? Because it changes the relationship that he has with God. God says, you're supposed to be here. Why aren't you? And he says, I can't be there anymore because the trauma of what's happened in my life makes me so afraid that I will be ever, forever be afraid in front of you. Right? Something traumatic has happened in his life that alters his identity. And by the way, in case we didn't realize that, the same kind of altering in identity occurred in, Je in Genesis chapter 12. 2 verse 23 I think maybe it's 24 right where he says uh, this is bone of my bone flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she came from man okay remember that okay of course in English we don't see the difference but in Hebrew it's really important because it's the first occurrence of the word ish remember we talked about ish yesterday what I told you is ish doesn't mean man does it what does it mean it means the summation of all the relationships that cause me to be who I am so what he says is, she shall be called woman because she constitutes all the relationships that I need to be who I am. I am man, right? In other words, I am man in relation to her. Before, by the way, in the Hebrew text, before that, he was Adam. Now, he's Ish. And he uses the term of himself to show that there's been a change in relationship which changes his identity. Okay? So he's no longer Adam, he's Ish. Ish. He's the one who introduces the word. It doesn't occur anyplace else in the text. In fact, following that text, it goes right back to Adam. Okay? But how he identifies himself is in relation to her. What he recognizes is that his identity is summarized in his relationship to her. Now skip forward to Genesis chapter 3. What happens to his relationship? His relationship to the woman is altered in relation to the, the disaster that's happened with God. Okay? So he becomes not the one who's, the, who's in relation to the woman, who, by the way, is the best thing that ever happened to him. All of a sudden, he becomes the fearful one. Right? And the reason he hides is because he's afraid. But he hasn't just become afraid. He now recognizes that his whole identity has changed so that not only was he afraid in the past, from his memory, remember? He now thinking, this is who I am. I'm the one who's afraid. And I will continue to be afraid. Okay? Now he treats the woman differently because it's no longer Ish and Isha. Now it's the one who's afraid. And what does that do for the relationship with the woman. How does Adam treat Isha after the fall? Trauma has something to do with the way that he changes the relationship. What does he do? He blames her. Right? What is blame? It's a protective, it's a protective action. You see, it says, I don't want to deal with that. It's your mistake. It's your fault. I'm putting the wall up that says, don't, don't try to blame me. It's you. I'm protecting myself with blame. Um, Brene Brown says something about blame. She says that blame is, uh, is, what is it? Repressed anger. Okay? So basically, what Adam does is break the relationship of Ish, Isha, where all of who he was was in relation to her and separates himself from that relationship because of the trauma that he's experienced with God and forces that trauma onto the woman. Okay? In fact, so much so that he names her Chava, which um, doesn't mean the mother of all living. You can read this in my book, Guardian Angel. Right? Chava is a very ancient word that actually is tied to the idea of serpent. In other words, there's a there's a uh, archaeological evidence that the word chava, spelled in that same way, shows up on a steel that's a you know column, right? That um, that is translated serpent. So what he does is he names her for his nemesis. The serpent is the one who caused him all this blame. So now from now on, I'm going to call you. Not Hava, woman, but serpent. 
Okay? Right? And <coughs> that's not the end of the trauma. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, she gets even. How? The only time that she speaks, except for the, except to the serpent, what does she say? I have... Now, we have to read it in Hebrew. I have bartered, I've negotiated a new, does she say, yeled, child? No. She says, a new ish, a new male in relation to me, whose identity depends on me. I have bartered, negotiated a new ish, and now we have this really impossible grammatical expression in Hebrew that can't mean what it says, but it does anyway. <laughs> It says, I have bartered a new ish with the help of the Lord. But that can't be right because the direct object means that the ish should be the direct object of bartered. And she makes God the direct object of bartered. And Dave, Rabbi David Foreman makes a point of this by saying that as far as Chava is concerned, she uses God as the genie to repress the trauma that she's felt from Adam and convert it into another purpose, her son. In other words, she replaces the man in her life with her son. Trauma continues, right? She negotiates with God to get what she wants. Does that sound familiar? Oh my gosh, what about Cain and Abel? Cain tries to negotiate. He doesn't get what he wants. What, what does he do? blames somebody else. Where do you suppose he learned that? Right? The trauma just continues from generation to generation. God is trying to tell us a story about what will happen with these traumatic events if we don't deal with them. Right? So, all trauma is pre-verbal. It's experience. It's emotion. It's not what I can cognitively come up with. It's the feelings that generate this. And there is a loneliness in feeling that is both necessary and true. So, healing doesn't happen in, a simple, in simple sound bites where the experience is just one thing or another. It barely happens in sentences and paragraphs where there is just one line of thought. Healing really happens in poetry where the paradoxes are written in emotion and contradiction and metaphor. Right? Now, why did I include that quote? Because the reason we love the Psalms is because the poetry of David is contradiction, emotion, and metaphor, and we can identify it with, directly with it because he's speaking the language of trauma. Right? He puts into words the feelings that we can't express. That's why the book of Psalms is so important to us. Is the Bible really poetry, metaphor, emotion, and contradiction? Yeah, I think so. And once we realize that, we stop looking for the resolution, the answers. You know, the last thing I will ever be is the Bible answer man. Because I don't think that there are answers there. Not in the Western world, anyway. Not in the sort of let's resolve all these things. I think that the answers that, that are there are the emotional catharsis that goes on when we start to realize these people are experiencing the same kinds of, of trauma events that we have so much trouble even bringing to the surface. Okay? So, let's reread the book. Abraham. Well, let me see. Abraham and Isaac. Let's talk about the trauma of Abraham and Isaac. Okay? Well, let's first talk about the trauma of Abraham. What does it say? What, what does the Bible say about Abraham's relationship to Is Ishmael? What does it say? It says that Abraham loved Ishmael and he grieved when he sent Ishmael and Hagar into the desert because he knew that was, they were going to die, right? What traumatic event was occurring in the relationship between Sarah and Abraham when that event occurred? What do you suppose the dynamics were like in the household? Right? I mean, we see that Sarah's attempt to orchestrate God's timing completely backfired in her life. But it spilled over, didn't it? 
It spilled over into her husband's life, into her husband's son's life, into Abraham's essentially second wife. It spilled over into, in, basically into execution. It spilled over into all kinds of things because instead of dealing with the trauma of not having a child with God, it, Sarah tries to orchestrate her way out of her feelings and in doing so, creates an enormous amount of traumatic experience for everybody else that spills over into the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, okay? Now, let's back up and look at Isaac, okay? So Abraham is incredibly obedient, saddles up this, the donkey, takes the two servants, off they go, and Isaac says, okay, here's the wood, here's the, you know, here's the fire, but where is the sacrifice? And what does Abraham say? God will provide, okay? Oh, that's really great. And Isaac is thinking, you know, my father is the one who's told me all my life, I'm the one, he loves me more than anything. Yeah, I know there was that kind of crazy incident where suddenly Ishmael disappeared from the camp, but nobody ever talks about that, okay? So he goes along, gets up to the altar, and he realizes all of a sudden that everything his father has told him is a lie. Because now his father is willing to sacrifice him on the basis of what some God tells him to do, right? Do you suppose that Isaac might have been traumatized? Well, a very interesting clue happens in Genesis because when Abraham comes back to the donkey with the two servants, it says, and Abraham returned. It doesn't say, and Abraham and Isaac returned. In other words, Isaac disappears from the narrative at that point, okay? In fact, the next time that we see Isaac, he's in Ber Lahai Roy. He doesn't come back with Abraham. Okay, so now you're Sarah, and you see Abraham and the two men and the donkey coming in the distance, but what you don't see is Isaac. What do you think? Well, he was willing to sacrifice Ishmael. In fact, there's one Midrashic um, opinion about what happened, and that is that when Abraham returns, Sarah died on the spot because she realized that Abraham had sacrificed her son as well. Okay? So, let's fast forward. The next time we see Isaac, he's at Ber Lachai Roy. What does Ber Lachai Roy mean? The well of what? Yes? The well of Roy, the well of my seeing. Okay? Ber Lachai Roy, the well, the well of my seeing. Who named that place? Huh? Hagar. So the place that Isaac goes following the, uh, the potential sacrifice is the place where. Hagar and Ishmael reside, Ber Lachai Roy. Why does he go there? Because they know what he's been through. They know the deceptiveness of Abraham. They know the rejection of the father. They know what it's like to be potentially sacrificed. He goes to the place where their trauma matches his trauma, and that's where we find him in the scripture, right? And from that point, we see Isaac become a different person, so much so that, that one of the rabbis that I talk about in, in one of my books actually says that um, Isaac views God as a demon, willing to do, willing to kill him to get his way, right? And you will notice that for the rest of Isaac's life, there's very, very little interaction with God at all, right? Something happens in Isaac's life that traumatically affects his relationship with God, okay? So we can now fast forward to Jacob. Same kind of thing going on. In fact, there's a book back there called Crossing, which is all about this family dynamic. What happens between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how that affects everybody down the line from there. And there's this really great, great um, verse in uh, the Jacob account where the Hebrew says, uh, essentially, 
that Jacob calls Abraham his father, not Isaac. Okay? I don't think it's a textual mistake. I think that there's a reason why Jacob doesn't view Abraham as his, I mean, doesn't view Isaac as his father, because Jacob's experience with Isaac is one of deception and trauma the whole time. You know? And who orchestrated all that? Well, certainly the mother's involved in all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of family dynamics going on there. Remember, uh, Isaac loved Esau, Esau right? You, you, you get the whole process. It's just getting more and more complicated, more and more dysfunctional. As we go along in the story, it gets worse and worse, right? And by the way, it turns out that Joseph has the same kind of experience. Remember the verse where it says, I, where um, Jacob sends, the, sends Joseph off to find his brothers, okay? So let's reread that story because on the first surface, it looks pretty innocent. Oh, where are the brothers? Well, you go find them, okay? What happens when Joseph finds them? They throw him into the pit intending to kill him and ultimately sell him as a slave. What do you suppose Joseph thinks about his father sending him to the place where, he, where his brothers now try to kill him? Oh, you mean he forgot about the story of the grandfather trying to sacrifice the grandson, the, the father trying to sacrifice... I mean, does that story not ring a bell? Why does his father send him to a place where the potential for, for, for execution exists? What do you suppose... Why is it that Joseph, the second most powerful man in the world, never bothers to communicate with his father? Never sends a message back saying, hey, dad, I'm alive. Never makes any attempt to actually reach the family. Why do you suppose that happens? Have we forgotten the trauma of Joseph's life and how it alters his identity so much so that he's willing to become an Egyptian and, and basically erase all of the family connections? How, how does he name his children? Right? He names them in opposition to the place he came from because the traumatic experience is so deeply ingrained in him that he can't even deal with communicating with them. Okay? Right? So, now we have a really interesting pattern. Generation after generation after generation of trauma that finds its way into the next se uh, sequence of children and then gets passed on and on and on until finally someone resolves it all. Okay? Well, at least potentially resolves it all. Who is the person who actually resolves the issue of of uh, father's betrayal, because that's basically what's happening, right? Isaac considers Abraham a, be uh, a betraying father. Jo Joseph considers Jacob a betraying father. Who actually resolves all that? The least likely candidate in the world, Pharaoh, right? Because what does Pharaoh do? He gives Jacob a new name, a new identity, a new status. He accepts Jacob as essentially his son. Joseph. Right? Joseph. He changes... Joseph. Oh, sorry, Joseph. Yeah. yeah. He changes Joseph's yeah. identity to become one of his family. Right? He does everything possible to undo the trauma that Joseph felt and reestablishes him with a new identity removed from all of that trauma. Pharaoh is the one who actually treats Joseph as a son, right? What's really interesting is the process of family disruption, which begins with Adam, is resolved by Pharaoh, the pagan non-believer that God uses to heal the entire family tradition, right? Amazing stuff, huh? You start thinking about reading the story differently, reading the story from its traumatic perspective, you see how one generation after another after another contributes to this growing uh, 
destructive behavior that's going on until finally you come across a man who doesn't even believe in God and God uses to heal the whole thing. Okay? Who really restores the father image? Pharaoh. Okay? Now, let's look at the rest. Just take a brief look at some of the other examples of emotional trauma that show up in these biblical stories. How about Elijah? I mean, Elijah has this fantastic success. He kills 400 of the false prophets. The fire comes down from heaven. Everybody sees that he's got the one true God. Then what happens? Oh, Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. What does Elijah do? Why? I mean, who's Jezebel compared to the fire coming out of heaven? Who's Jezebel compared to the 400 prophets that he just slew? Why does he run? Because his emotions take over. Not because of his rational thinking, right? What about Jonah? Right? Do you think Jonah is rational when he says, uh, well, you know, Lord, I don't really want to go there because I don't really want you to save these people, so I'm just going to run away from you, right? Do you think that's rational, right? What about Jeremiah? What does Jeremiah say? Hey, better that I was never born than to have to tell these people that you're not going to save them and they're going into captivity. Just let me pray for them. What does God say? No, nope, you can't pray for them. They need to be punished. Wait, wait, they're all going to blame me. Right? What about Moses? Oh, there's a great book by Zornberg called uh, a Moses, A Life. And what she points out is all of the emotional dysfunctionality that's in Moses' life that ultimately ends up in Moses being prohibited from going into the promised land. It has nothing to do with just hitting the rock instead of speaking to it. It has to do with a long history of his dissatisfaction with the behavior of the people. And in fact, you'll see that in the beginning of Deuteronomy, Moses doesn't say he's not going into the land because he broke one of God's rules. You know what he says? I'm not being allowed to go into the land because of you and your rebelliousness. And right up to the end, he blames them for his, for his disappointment. Okay? I mean, there's a lot of emotional stuff going on in trauma in Moses' life as well. And how could you expect otherwise? What happens at the beginning of his life? Right? Sat out in the basket, went nur nurtured in a, in a completely alien culture, uh, hidden identity, all this kind of stuff that's going on, it certainly affects him. How about Noah? Oh, there's that famous passage of Noah getting drunk. You know, he, he does the wine thing. I think that there's a lot more going on than what we're just looking at, not being too drunk and naked, right? Because the Hebrew is really interesting. It says that when Noah comes to his senses, he, he curses, oh, by the way, who does he curse? This will help you try to figure out what's going on there. Who does he curse? Yeah. What? Grandson. He curses the grandson. Why? Well, the grandson had nothing to do with it. The grandson wasn't even around when all this happened, right? Why doesn't he curse the son? Why does he curse the grandson? I want you to think hard about the use of Hebrew phrases. Remember we said one phrase used in one place connects you to phrases used in another place? Okay? So go back and look at the Hebrew text again and ask yourself, what exactly are the phrases that are used for the description of Noah's nakedness? And what you may discover is that that Hebrew idiom is about sexual relationships with wives. And what actually I think is happening there is that just, and by the way, we have a repeat of this. Remember Reuben? Reuben tries to take over by betting one of the concubines of his father. So I think what happens is Noah's drunk, he passes out, one of his sons has sex with his wife in order to assert his authority over the, over the continuing tribe. Noah realizes that and curses the child the grandson, not the son. Right. Reread the story. Okay? And Isaac, of course, same thing. Isaac avoids God all of his life until the very end. And by the way, do we really think that Isaac doesn't know that it's, that it's uh, uh, not Esau in front of him? 
Is Isaac so out of it? Oh my, what does it say? Uh, I'm feeling old, I might die, let me give the blessing now before I die. How many years more does Isaac live after that? 50? <laughs> I mean, is Isaac, and by the way, the sons have been around the family for 60 years. Do you suppose Isaac doesn't know the difference between the two boys? Right? There's all kinds of clues in there that he actually does know what's happening. But now he's going to make up for the fact that for 60 years he's been avoiding what God wanted him to do. Okay? You can read it in my book, Crossing. All of this stuff, and Adam we talked about, all of this stuff is emotional, traumatic stuff written into the text. The text is the screenplay. You get to add all the pieces that make sense of it from a human perspective, and all that emotional stuff is what God's dealing with all the way through. And by the way, you recognize some really interesting things. God doesn't show up very often. Right? There are a few passages here and there where God shows up, but most of the time, God's absent from the story. Think about Joseph. Does Joseph say, oh, let me interpret this, this uh, dream for you. I'll just pray about it. No. All right? Jacob. Does God show up in Jacob's life? Well, yeah, he does, actually, at one point where he gives him the vision. And what does Jacob say? Okay, well, after you do all this for me, God, then I'll think about whether I'm going to serve you. Right? Jacob is the negotiator, the, bar, the, the, you know, the barterer. Right? I mean, think about how many times God doesn't show up, and yet the story goes on and on and on, and we know that God's handiwork is underneath it all, orchestrating it, managing it, in spite of the fact that there's so much family dysfunctionality and so much emotional trauma going on. If that can happen in, that, in those stories, from one generation to the next to the next, don't you think it can happen for us? Don't you think that going down the spiral staircase and going through the shadows at each corner or each turn is worth it? I mean, look what God is doing here. How many generations did it take for God to get to the point where he finally reestablishes himself as the real father? And by the way, through a pagan guy, right? So, isn't the story of the garden and the sin of Adam just a trauma story? Not a theological story, a trauma story. Why does Adam try to hide? What introduced Adam to the idea of fear? He wasn't afraid before, right? And by the way, you'll notice that he doesn't say, I am afraid because I sinned. He never says that, right? Think about it. Sin isn't the reason that he hides. Some other reason there. Think about that. Go back and look at the text again. Why doesn't he forgive his wife? Why doesn't he say, you know what? We both made a mistake. Let's start again. If he just said that, it would have changed everything. But he doesn't. Why? Okay. What was it like for Noah and his family to experience the trauma of a destroyed earth without any guarantees that they would find another world to live in? I mean, think about that. They watch their entire world be destroyed. Do you think that's a traumatic event? They floated on the water for a year. Do you think that might be traumatic? <coughs> what would happen if you watched your whole world submerge and die? Everything. What was it like to know that God was responsible for all of that? Right? I mean, what kind of a God is that that will kill everything? And by the way, it specifies, and even the plants. Right? I mean, this is not like, oh, let's just get rid of all the bad people. Let's just wipe out everything. I don't know about you, but I might think that that God was somebody to be afraid of. Okay? Perhaps we really haven't paid attention to Isaac. Isaac lives his life within the parameters of the abyss and, survive, and survives for, poster, for posterity as a realization that this is only a possibility. Total annihilation, a burnt offering, the knowledge that it would have been better if man had never been born, never been created. This is the tohu. Remember tohu vabohu, right? Nothingness of which Isaiah speaks and which ultimately he rejects. He did not create it, the world, a waste, right? But Isaiah comes 1,500 years later, okay? The absurdity, the inhuman waste of the world of tohu ruled by the Greek moria, that's fate, 
the malevolent gods of fates, necessity and science, is countered by the negation of Lotahu. Rashi's comment spells out the existential force of this degeneration, or this uh, denegation, against the meta-silence of Tohu. Remember because it says, and the world was formless and void. Remember, okay? In which human acts are gratuitous. They have no effect. God gives Torah, which is founded in the promise of justice. Great reward is the affirmation at the heart of darkness. But you have to believe that to get through the trauma that these people experience. For Sarah dies of the unbearable lightness of being. <laughs> the restoration of Isaac in no way palliates the horror of what might have happened. For Sarah, this is not a test, a three-day trial of faith culminating in rescue and vindication. She, rather than Abraham, faces the full anguish of the already slaughtered one. His survival changes nothing. Her invocation to him holds the full measure of her situation. Woe to the son of the drunken woman. The image of her own unhinging, of an ecstasy, literally a standing outside oneself, in which all stability is undermined, involves mother and son in a miasma of absurdity. In a real sense, as the sages put it, his ashes remain piled on the altar, though he may walk on the earth as large as life. What happened in the Akedah cannot be neutralized, though the sacrifice is not literally consummated. The burden of the all-but condition is assumed by Sarah, who consummates its meaning in the howls in her death. Right? Moses, emotional condition of Israel in captivity. What would it be like to be under those conditions? What would it be like to be in the wilderness with, for 40 years with people who rebel, who refuse to follow God, who you have to chastise and have to intercede for all the time? What would that be like for 40 years of that? Right? Paul, for all have sinned, but isn't sin disconnection? What if we read the verse, for all are disconnected? Would that make a difference? For all are disconnected. For not for all of sin, broken some moral rules, but for all are traumatized. All are disconnected. Because isn't ultimately the purpose of God to be reconnected to us? Right? Are we really different under the skin so that some of us are sinners and some of us aren't? Or is it in fact the case that disconnection is what we're struggling against and what the Bible shows us is how God deals with those people who experience disconnection up the down staircase parenting in short is a dance of the generations whatever affected one generation but has not been fully resolved will be passed on to the next and boy you see that in the biblical text the generations are boxes within boxes inside my mother's violence you will find another box which contains my grandfather's violence. And inside that box, I suspect, but do not know, you will find another box with some such black secret energy. Stories within stories receding into time. And the reason that we love the Bible and the reason that it's so important to us, to us is because God unpacks the boxes so that we can see that what happens in Isaiah happened before in the kings, happened before in Samuel, happened before in Joshua, happened before in Genesis. Back and back we go to unpack the boxes so that we can see how it all started. Right? We can see what God was doing all along the way and what little needed to be changed in order to alter everything. For example, suppose Abraham had said to Isaac, not God will provide, but this is what God has asked me to do, my son. Even though I will obey him, it will break my heart. Please accept this and come with me. Wouldn't that have changed everything? But the difference is Abraham doesn't speak. He doesn't tell his son what's happening. So at the end, Isaac has to interpret Abraham's actions without clarification. And the only thing that he can interpret is that Abraham lied to him. And Abraham abandoned him, and his father really never loved him. And all of that spills over into generation after generation. If individuals are part of a multi-generational family system, 
Families and individuals are also parts of a much larger whole, the culture and the society in which they live. The functioning of a human being can no more be isolated from the larger social context than one can of a bee in a hive. It is not enough, therefore, to stop at the family system as if it is determining the, determining the health of its members without regard to the social, economic, and cultural forces that shape family life. And that is the reason that we need to understand what happened in Egypt in order to understand what happens to the Israelites when they come out of Egypt. Because it's cultural, social, it's all that stuff, right? Blame becomes meaningless if one understands how family history stretches back through time, through generation. Who's to blame? Am I to blame because I respond to my mother's trauma because she was assaulted as a teenager, which I never knew about while she was alive? Because no one ever stood up for her and she felt like she had to protect herself from everyone because no one stood, for, stood in her place? Because something happened in her family that no one would talk about that went on for the previous generation? And it, does that make me responsible for the for the mistakes that I've made in trying to deal with the trauma that was handed to me? No, I don't think so. I think what happens is we respond to the trauma that we inherit when it's never resolved from one generation to the next. You pass it on to your kids. I can see it in my kids now. I can, my, you know, my sons are 50 years old. They struggle with the same kinds of things that I struggled with because no one ever talked about it, right? It was a family secret. If Roseanne were here, she would tell you, in a Sicilian family, you don't talk about things outside the family. What does that mean? The trauma gets passed on from one generation to the next. It's inevitable. It doesn't just go away because you pray about it. Right? The Bible teaches us that. It seems to me the Bible teaches us anything else. I told you yesterday, the most important thing the Bible ever teaches us is that God cares. And now let's apply it here. God cares what happens to you. And the only way that he can undo that is to show you stories of people who went through those things and he undid it. It just took five or six generations to do that, or sometimes more. Okay? It's no coincidence that addictions arise mostly in cultures that subjugate communal goals, time-honored tradition, and individual creativity to mass production and the accumulation of wealth. Addiction is one of the outcomes of the existential vacuum, the feeling of emptiness engendered when we place a supreme value on selfish attainments. And I could also say, when we don't communicate what happened to us as a way to heal our children. Right? So, trauma robs you of the feeling that you're in control of yourself, of what I call self-leadership. The challenge of recovery is to reestablish ownership of your own body and mind of yourself. This means feeling free to know what you know and to feel what you feel without becoming overwhelmed, enraged, ashamed, or collapsed. In other words, you need to take that wheel and figure out how you really feel. For most people, this involves finding a way to become calm and focused, learning to maintain that calm in response to images, thoughts, sounds, or physical sensations that remind you of the past, finding a way to be fully alive in the present and engage with people around you, not having to keep secrets from yourself, including secrets about the way you have managed to survive. Now, if you took those ideas and you apply them to the biblical text, you can see that that's exactly what God's doing. He's finding a way for you to read the Psalms and become calm. He's helping you to learn to maintain a focus on him in the midst of the thoughts, sounds, and physical sensations that remind you of the things that you couldn't control that, that, that were threats to you. He wants you to bear one another's burdens, communicate, right? and engage with people who are also in this process of healing, and to stop keeping secrets from yourself. <laughs> you know, the theology tells me that God knows. My emotions tell me I wish he didn't. 
Right? I need to resolve those things. I need to understand that he knows and he still cares. It's me. I'm the one who's afraid to look, not God. Okay. As long as you keep secrets and suppress information, you are fundamentally at war with yourself. The critical issue is allowing yourself to know what you know. That takes an enormous amount of courage. That's it. I think we need to read the Bible differently. We need to start asking ourselves, what happened to these people? Because right? it happened to me. Look, all of these, uh, I, I, I can give Scott all of these slides and stuff so you don't have to worry about, you know, getting them on your phone. I'm happy to share those. And the work I've done with inner healing, holistic medicine, functional medicine, I repeatedly tell people, women tend to get this a little more easily. Emotional roots are the most overlooked component of healing. Yep. But you see, I think that's central to the Bible. I think we read the Bible emotionally and we come away with a very different picture. Unfortunately, in the West, we've been taught to read the Bible theologically. So we're looking for statements of truth instead of experiences of people in the hands of trauma and the interaction of God. Yep. Okay. So my story is my story is our story. You and I have the same story together. It's one for all, all for one. We suffer together, we recover together. That's what Paul says, right? What does Paul say? Right? Weep together, bear one another's burdens, be joyful together. It's the same idea, right? There is no individual recovery. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the biblical terms at all, right? God cannot be father until we are brothers and sisters. All right, tomorrow we'll try a less uh, dramatic topic, maybe. Very significant. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm. People tell me when I, I write, you know, I write this thing called Today's Word, which is a kind of look at um, a particular Greek or Hebrew word every day from Scripture. And most of the time, the comments that I get the most comments back on is when I start talking about this kind of stuff. Not just the theology, not just the the history of the culture, but when it when we really start talking about what, how does this impact us? How does it really reach into who we are? Yeah, you because know? we all came from some dark shadow somewhere. Yes, dear. way of seeing and then the linear I mean they're just so completely different there's you know but <laughs> but I mean it just seems like it's it's not working but it is you know they're not it's not an atomic war so actually I mean, there must be some kind of crossover going on or no, no I, just I think what happened is the western world, world I just don't know what to ask I don't know how yeah. to ask yeah. question. No, no I, I think, think you're right. right. They are really radically different and in opposition. And unfortunately, we grew up in the Western world, and the Western world, since Plato, has adopted this linear, you know, straight line growth idea, which we find in every part of our existence, politics, economics, so social life. It's all about progress, 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 right? It, nobody talks about the spiral staircase where you see the same thing over and over and you just react to it differently. It's always, let's fix that problem and get on. And it's, it's affected how we think of who we are. And, I, and, it's, and the reason that it seems so overwhelming is because it's been going on for 2,500 years. Right? 2,500 years of Greek influence makes a big difference. Now what we're saying is, Oh my gosh, let's stop reading the Bible as though it were a Western book. 
and start looking at what's happening in the biblical text from a different perspective, the Semitic perspective, which has absolutely nothing to do with our linear idea of truth. Right? We'll talk some more about that tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, if you want to get a book, now I can run back there with my swipe.